if this means ceding uh, meaning back to men and saying, well, women shouldn't be doing these things and men should be in charge, fine. I think men might have to seize it back. But the problem is you've also got weak men who are um, not standing up, even for women, right? Even in basic sense, like against the trans stuff or whatever. And I think it's hard for there not to be this cycle of resentment where one sex is saying, but you've done this and the other is saying, you've done that. And it's like, how do we break out of this resentment and say, okay, let's have a conversation. How do we make everything um, you know, uh, it put it in its proper place, right? So let's say, okay, women tried running things, it was shit, let's give it back to men, you know? All CEOs should be men, or blah, 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 right? Whatever, do you know what I mean? All right, here we are in London with none other than Carl Benjamin, a.k.a. Sargon of Akkad. How are you today, sir? Cold. Cold, yes, it is a very cold day. And Nina Power, author, and how would you describe yourself? Maniac. Maniac. That's a good one. That's a good. Very smart. I have two very smart people on the lines today playing Spectrum Street Epistemology. All right. Conservatism helps women more than liberalism. Don't move yet. Let's start with the definition of conservatism. You, who wants to try? You want to try? Sure. I mean, I'd say ideally it's the preservation of the existing order and the very slow movement of politics in an organicist way. Right, rather than kind of radical or revolutionary reform or change, um, based in an, an idea of the natural order. Is that cool for you? Yeah, I'd agree with that definition. Okay. All right. So, Reed, let me see it again. Conservatism helps women more than liberalism. Move. Oh, or you don't have to move. You can stay on the neutral if you want. You can stay on the neutral. Okay, why do you agree with that? Tell him, tell him. Okay, well, it's not necessarily on the basis of actually existing conservatism, which I think has never been tried. So I think <laughs> free market liberalism is not conservatism. But if we are taking conservatism to be the definition I said, I would say it, in principle, is much more on the side of women because of... Um, you know, the inability of men and women to change their biology. I think liberalism gives priority to male desire, which is often really twisted and should be res restrained for everyone's good. So I would say conservatism insofar as it promotes moral values and, and speaks to a higher order and an order of being, uh, also uh, should give reverence to women in their, in their specificity and difference. Wow, there was a lot there. Is there anything you want to pick up on and comment on? Um no, but the reason I'm on neutral is because I think in the long term, yes, but in the short term, no, is the answer. There are two different kinds of benefits that we can distinguish here. Uh, and in the immediate case, liberalism, of course, benefits women in a direct material and hedonistic way. But of course, I don't believe this is uh, really what women need in the long run or really want in the long run and so i'm vaguely neutral because conservatism has many flaws as well i mean i suppose i would actually really be on slightly agree you can move I, if you I want i kind of hate the term conservatism uh -huh. and i kind of hate that it's committed to a losing proposition uh, and so you in a because things are going to change no no it's not the fact that things are going to change it's that conservatism is defined in opposition to liberalism yeah. and so really it's going to end up at the same point just at a slightly slower pace and so i'm kind of neutral on it because they're both going to be the same uh, catastrophic disaster for both women and men actually yeah, I think in reality that's true. I think that conservatism and, and socialism or whatever we might oppose to it are basically two forms of liberalism, right? They're just, like you say, one is slower than the other potentially, although when it comes to free markets, actually not necessarily because you have all kinds of like radical reform in particular areas. So yeah, I, that's why I said like real conservatism has never been tried because um, I, I think a politics that was organicist and that actually stem from a genuine recognition of our reality and our place in the cosmos, right? Wouldn't we? I don't know what we would call it, right? But it, huh? 
we'd call it traditionalism. Yes, but, you know, traditionalism or something like this, you know, that also recognise, I think maybe we disagree, Peter, on this, our desire, our innate desire for religion and, and our cult-like behaviour. You know, I think rationalism is a, you know, an, another part of liberalism and the Enlightenment has loads of uh, failings and flaws as well, you know, and, and, and we're seeing that, the aftermath of that at the moment, you know, where people are desperately trying to fill the God-shaped hole with a load yeah. of nonsense, you know. Yeah. Is there anything that either one of you said that would cause you to move to the slightly agree? Is there anything he said that would nudge you over? Um, well, I mean, insofar as we are, I agree with him in the sense that liberalism, conservatism and so on are all, are all part of the same thing. Yes. So in that sense, whether we're talking about the ideal type or whether we're talking about really ex the reality. Yeah. I mean, we'd probably come closer. Maybe. Is there anything she said that would nudge you to the slightly agree? Um yeah, like I said, I, I could possibly go to the slightly agree just on the basis that getting to an undesirable destination more slowly is probably better for everyone. Okay, I have a new claim. Traditionalism is better for everyone than liberalism. Move. <clears throat> oh, you're both on agree. Why are you on agree? Well, okay. <laughs> I suppose insofar as it cleaves to human nature, right? So if we if we understand that you know we have limits and that we that we are sexually dimorphic and all of these kinds of things, and that we have a relationship to nature and we are part of nature, and I mean again, we'd probably have to start by defining traditionalism because obviously we might say, well, there are various kinds of traditionalism that are not actually particularly good and are slightly authoritarian and 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 so on, right? So. We'd have to agree a definition, I think, of traditionalism. So maybe Carl would want to define. Well, before he defines it, before he defines it, why did you go to the agree? Um, because traditionalism won't end up at the same position as liberalism when it has finished its dialectical process. Where will it end up? Uh, or end up nowhere? It, well, it, it doesn't end. That's the, the point. Liberalism actually has a desired end state that it wishes for us all to arrive in. And it's pretty undesirable from the position of anyone who isn't a 20-something student. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> am I wrong? No, no. Um, uh, and so traditionalism is really accepting that there is no end of history, that actually history carries on and people have a place in that, uh, whether they like it or not. It's kind of... It's kind of like a river of civilization that continually flows forward. And at some point you'll have your part on that in that river and you'll pass that on to future generations and it'll change its character depending on the circumstances, but it'll always maintain a certain kind of tone or tenor to it because of the civilization yeah. in which you're in and which you're a part of, which is why you, you say traditionalism. Well, obviously I've got to be parochial about it mm -hmm. and say British traditionalism um, because of course that will be the traditions of the United Kingdom, rather than say Arabian traditionalism right. or something like that, which I can understand you might want to take exception to. Right, um, I sh and I should have qualified it, that. In it's this. okay. I think it's yeah. I think it's presupposed that I mean, British yeah. people in Britain talking about traditionalism means yeah, British yeah, yeah. traditionalism. Um, I I have one one for you. I want to pick up on something you said. So Ayan Hirsi Ali is now a Christian. Rob Snyder is. Um, uh, uh, a Christian, more and more people uh, in the first in the quote unquote anti woke space are becoming Christian, and then more and more people we've seen a, a, a rather stark rise. So the claim is, and I'll step out of the way, it is a good thing that more people are becoming Christians. Move. Well, wow, you're on strongly agree, Nina. Carl, you're on agree. Why do you strongly agree? And are you a Christian yourself? I am, yes. Um, okay. But recently, so I was brought up like a liberal, secular subject. My parents are slightly pagan, if anything, which I have a great deal of affection for because at least it's a sort of belief and commitment in, in nature and, you know, the reality of the world, right? So I'd say I'm like a pagan Christian, which is not really possible, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> people come to God through all kinds of strange, you know, means. Uh, and I'm totally pro people converting. Uh, people were attacking Ayan Hirsi Ali, but I, I don't see the problem at all, you know. And she no doubt has a personal conversion story. She was telling a civilizational story. Um, I think, you know, the, the world as it's presented to us in this regime is like a bureaucratic, materialistic, liberal, individualistic world, right? With no horizon, nothing outside of it. It's just this kind of, you know, hedonic hamster wheel. It's incredibly depressing. It's incredibly nihilistic. Um, we saw during lockdown this, you know, the idea that the like, 
that was it. The state was just there. That was everything was bureaucratic. I think anybody who can see beyond that, like in a religious way, anyone who can see that there's more to life than the state and this kind of, um, you know, mundane existence is onto something. Right. And I, I think that even if that wasn't Christianity, I, I would say Christianity makes sense in the West. This is why uh, uh, Ian Hersey Ali was correct to make it a civilizational point because it's partly to do with the way that developed in particular places, right? In relation to the secular, in relation to, you know, tradi various traditions and so on. And even the churches where they are located and so on, like stem out of an organic reality of the okay. country. Um, you, you think it's a good thing, you, you agree that it's a good thing that can I move I slightly agree you can move anywhere you want <laughs> just something that she say push you the other way no no I was I was reflecting on it myself I do agree that it would it would be um, a good thing if um, more people were Christian I'm I'm an atheist because I was born and raised in a secular liberal society um, but I think that it won't really make a difference in the long run because I think that the actual live reality mm. of what people are actually doing isn't really very Christian um, yeah. In, in his um, notes on culture, uh, T.S. Eliot talks about our revealed religions, and the revealed religion is what you do on a daily basis and how you do it, the character that informs all of this. And actually, if you look at the Islamic world, a lot of it is very revealingly Islamic, but very little of the West is actually revealed to be Christian. Um, it seems that the materialistic enlightenment has really destroyed any spiritual sense of community and nationhood that our country once had and i don't think it's coming back and so it seems like a kind of lament uh when people convert christianity now to me which i'm not happy to say but i've yeah. got to be honest about it that's a that's a sobering uh proposition can i respond on that yeah of course you can Sorry, I, I quite... No, 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 no. But I think, but I think, optimistically, even though we're we're coming from this place of total ruin and desolation, and indeed, like this, you know, materialistic universe, there's only this horizon. Actually, when people do convert, there is something going on, right? There, there is a, basically a kind of um, opportunity for moral choice, for example, right? You have a framework in which things start to look slightly different. You also have a parish. You have a community, however broken, however desolate, however you know, destroyed. And I, I mean, there, there are huge problems with the Church of England, let's be clear, right? They've become like another woke institution. And I actually wonder if more people might not convert from Anglicanism to Catholicism to Orthodox, you know, because precisely the, the less um, institutions that are supposed to be spiritual offer a genuine alternative, the more people are not going to be interested in because it's just like the NHS or a school or whatever. Everything has the same stupid ideology, right? And the church is making a huge mistake in trying to go along with that. But I do think in reality, the material reality of you know, converting or becoming Christian does actually change your moral horizon, even if we're talk ta talking from a place of desolation and ruin. You know, I think there is hope and you know, a, a new way of being and thinking, however minimally, right? Sure, but I, I suppose my critique here is that Christianity is far more like an aesthetic rather than a true and sincere belief. Um, it seems to me that liberalism has permeated absolutely everything. Um, I mean, if we went back 500 years and showed, well, 700 years, and showed Richard the Lionheart the state of England at the moment, he'd be going on a crusade. He would actually be fighting for these things. I mean, the very idea that there are mosques in England, a Christian should find personally abominable. And we don't see any Christian terrorism because the Christians are deeply, deeply embedded in the liberal paradigm. And this is why I think it's just too little too late. He seems to strongly agree with something. Uh, I, don't know. I think I'm persuading him <laughs> over. And just as a, as, a, as a data point, we can look at the... Palestinian Christians versus Palestinian Muslims and look at rates of terrorism, suicide bombing, et cetera, just as one, one data point for that. So the question that I had asked before was about uh, if more people converting to Christianity is a good thing. I have another question. More people can in the UK, this is only for the UK, more people converting to Islam in the UK is a good thing. Move. So you're on neutral, Nina, and Carl's on strongly disagree. Mm. So 
all of the argument and the reasons that you gave about seeing beyond yourself, beyond bureaucracy, yeah. that seems to only apply to Christianity. Not straightforwardly. I mean, I just want to say also that I think, you know, one of the issues with... with Come over here, sorry. Sorry, <laughs> sorry about the that. History, the history of Christianity is that, that, you know, liberalism comes out of Christianity, right? Like, let's, let's be clear. And this is, I think, what Carl is pointing to, this long telos, like this development of these ideas, right? So it may well be that Christianity, in its precise form and its beliefs and commitments and values ultimately will always end up in a liber in liberalism right like it, well that's what's happened right so islam we might want to say is slightly different in terms of its fundamental commitments right it has a direct relation to allah there's no mediation right like you know i i would say clearly parts of well, that's like protestantism as well well yeah, but you still have the Trinity, right? So there's no in Islam. There's like the direct relation to God is is much more like immediate, right? And it's it doesn't have the kind of turn the other cheek aspect, right? Which is also Christianity's weakness in a sense. It can't fight for itself ultimately, right? Yeah. So Islam is is more warlike in its constitution, right? So so if 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 everybody in the UK if the UK became predominantly. This is not the, a, a claim. I'm just. I'm just trying to figure out what, what you mm. mean. If the majority of the population in the UK were Muslim, do you think that would be a good thing? I think. I mean, Michel Welbeck explores this in Submission, which is a fantastic novel. When he's thinking about France and the Islamification of France, a very funny book. I would say no, it wouldn't be a good thing in one sense because that is not the tradition of Britain, and it would go against all of our other traditions, obviously. But in the sense that I think spiritual uh, commitment is a good thing. And I know many Muslims who are extremely, um, you know, we would say moderate, who are extremely um, ethical people, who are extremely beautiful individuals. So, and, and that's deeply tied up with their Muslim faith, right? So I can't condemn Islam, right, as such, because it's not this one thing, right? It's, it's not a monolith. No, it's not. Okay, so now... W w tell her why you strongly disagree if more people in the UK became Muslim would be a good thing. Because I'd like the UK to be a Christian country and I think that the fact that a Christian can be neutral on the spread of Islam in Britain is kind of why Christianity is losing and why Islam is winning. And it, I think this is, speaks to the genuine sincere conviction that I think Christians actually kind of lack. There needs to be a return to a crusading spirit. Now, Islam doesn't have a place in Britain. Historically, Britain's interaction with Islam was war. Um, and so the fact that we've allowed liberalism to do this to us is quite concerning. And, and like I said, I don't say this as a Christian. Right. I say I'm this as an atheist. Right. Yeah, right. You know, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm very frustrated with the Christian laxity. And I think really that at the bottom of it, why would you convert to Christianity if it doesn't even believe in itself enough to claim those people as its own believers? It's not trying to recruit those people to Christianity. It's not being jealous against other faiths. It's saying, well, we're going to have a tolerant live and let live attitude, which is why I think it's losing. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't disagree, but I would say I would prefer it if people were religious rather than liberal right so i think belief religious belief is preferable to secular secular hedonism right any religious belief <laughs> pretty much um i mean maybe that's an absolutely nonsense thing to say but i suppose it's also like at the the level of, a question of scale right like who wins what in the long term right is our concern with this life or is it with another life right is it with the life to come right and i think if you are truly religious this world is a, a temporary veil of tears, you know, and that's actually what you you believe, you know. And in the meantime, you you try to be good and and do your best and all of those sorts of things, and that's it. So, do 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 you think there's a kind of egalitarianism among faiths? They're all equal, and that they point towards the transcendent, as Paul Tillich and others say. There's kind of like this pointing to the beyond and you think that the very fact that it points is good independent of the specific truth claims or metaphysical claims it makes yeah very broadly and i would say alongside traditionalism i think perennialism is a very interesting attempt to try to sort of think about what is uh in common with all of these different faiths if you see what i mean like what is what what are the core truths of um religious belief right okay i have a claim well just a 
Yeah, yeah. Thing. I, I'm gonna, I, I'm I gonna do this sure. to you because I did that to her, and then I'm gonna go back again. Because I know I'm gonna get a hundred thousand people telling me I'm a sexist, not just racy, Jew hating homophobe. <laughs> what do you think? I, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I think I think this really is the revealed weakness of Christianity and the lack of genuine sincerity that Christians actually have. And I'm not trying to call you out personally. This is this is something that um, I think is. Um, a really congenital problem with Christianity in the West. You're not making a claim on the monopoly of truth in your faith, um, whereas that's what a religious faith is. This is the real truth. Everyone else is not only wrong, but in the case of Islam, you should be calling them heretics. You should be calling them actual um, blasphemers, in a way. But you apparently don't do that. And so this is uh, a really deep issue that I think Christianity has, and it speaks to the moral weakness of the Christians in the modern era. It's like they don't believe their own doctrines. Um, I mean, I'm not saying I do, but then I should be called a, an apostate. Right. You know, I, sh I should be denounced as well. Um, and if a, if a faith yeah. can't summon it in the, itself the energy and the conviction to do this, then I don't see why people wouldn't end up looking at a faith that can summon that conviction right. and say, well, actually... I think maybe on the face of it, they might be right. I don't know anything about theology, but this guy really seems to believe, and you seem to have a bit of a soft position on things. So, do you want to comment on that? Because I have another claim. <laughs> uh, one, one nitpick: not not an apostate, but a heretic or an infidel, right? Well, uh, we would say Christian children. Oh, an apostate, so, not from an individual believer, yeah. but from a cultural, like from a, a macro. Yeah, civilization. Sort of. Okay. All religions are equally good. I'll say where I am. <laughs> You're on the strongly disagree, Carl and Nina. You, you move to the slightly disagree. Wow, that's interesting. Why? Well, I mean, all religions, okay. I mean, yeah. you're talking about everything from like tiny cults to Scientology to you know. I mean, what's your, what's the breadth? Of what's your... the umbrella? Uh, well, uh. Yeah, I, I would say that. That's that's fair enough. I mean, I think there's a like, deep anthropological question, which is the one I'm interested in, perhaps, above all, which is, what is this human need to believe, right? What is this oh. desire for ritual, this desire for meaning, you know, which, which liberalism tried to solve but couldn't quite, right? And that, that people will end up sort of believing in absolute nonsense, right, rather than not believe at all. It's actually very hard to be a consistent atheist. I mean, that I'm would... Not. Huh? I'm not... Right, but that would be the interesting question, right? So, what does it mean actually to be to be an atheist? You know. Okay, I have a claim. A spiritual life is required for a good life. Oh no! Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Nothing's equal. Equal means same, and these things are all different. Therefore, there must be an equal. So it's nonsense. Yeah. Fine. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> so not not so to to be equal they'd have to be the same. but what if they produced equally uh positive outcomes for the flourishing of society uh i would question the means by which that is being interrogated and yeah. the standards by which being held to yeah. i mean it makes it sound like religion is instrumental rather than an attempt at understanding a transcendent truth about the universe ah uh, okay but let's say that just run with me in the thought experiment mm -hmm. let's say there is no transcendent truth about the universe the whole God thing is made up, but believing and acting a certain way yields certain outcomes. Sure. Is it possible that groups of people who have radically, a radically different content to their belief, you know, walking on water, praying, you know, not eating pork, etc., that it is the, I guess it's kind of a weird way to a Hindu conception of it, but sincere believers if the entire society were sincere believers, it would yield some positive outcomes. And if other societies did that, it would also yield positive outcomes. And when you match those positive outcomes against each other, they'd be roughly similar. No, if you do different things, you get different outcomes. Yeah, that's the problem with that. So idea. there's, there's yeah. just simply no getting around it. Unless people do the same thing, they won't get the same outcome. And your beliefs do inform what you do and how you do them. Okay, well, that lends itself to the question, is there a way to figure out, bracket the supernatural claims, mm -hmm. is there a way to figure out which religions will yield better results? It depends by the standard from which you're measuring the results. If you are a sincere 
Islamic believer, you might actually yeah, think that okay. the materialism and hedonism of the West is an okay. undesirable result. Okay. So so maybe, okay, I realize that this is, I've got a philosopher over here. I realize that this is, this is begging the question, but what if the, <laughs> I know you're gonna, you guys are going to both jump on me for yes. this, but what if the result is human flourishing? Well, you can't really argue that the Islamic world isn't flourishing. Um, but oh, again, that what, it is flourishing. Or oh, is absolutely. It? I mean, oh. I don't know what metric you'd use, but if, say, population growth is one of those metrics, okay. they're doing brilliantly. Yeah. Uh, and actually, the Christian world is an um, atheist world is dying a slow death and doesn't even realize it. So it really depends on what you consider flourishing to be. Mm. I mean, the mosques are full and the churches are empty. Yeah, I mean, flourishing is really a Greek concept in the first place, right? It's so the utilitarian metric is like the wrong one to apply to it because the, the whole framework is different, right? I would say flourishing in the original sense is to do with perhaps fulfilling one's capacity, right? And something like we have differential skills, right? We might be better or worse at different things. And it's about whether those things are yeah. enacted, right? So, I mean, of course you could scale it up and say, well, is a culture flourishing? Is a society flourishing? Is a country flourishing? You know, sort of, you can do that, right? But again, the metrics you're seem you're sort of fusing, it seems to me like utilitarianism and yeah. a kind of Greek model. And I wouldn't do that personally. <laughs> so I, I think if I may attack my own question, yes. I, I, <laughs> I think the problem with my question was is that when you assume flourishing, Islamic fundamentalists, they don't give a shit about flourishing. They want society. They want the spread of Islam. They want strict adherence, submission. They I want adherence. They just, I think they just have a different definition of what flourishing means. Oh, so if they, you they, think if they do, if they achieve these ends, these metrics are quote unquote flourishing, they will be flourishing. Yeah, I think that um, strictly orthodox Islamic people could look at the Islamic world and say, yeah, we're doing pretty well actually. And I've seen them make the argument that actually our countries are doing well. We're just not hedonistically economically focused like you are um but that's why we're going to exist in the future and you won't yeah i guess to 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 use a cruder a more a vulgar example you can say for someone not only caught caught in the orbit of the ideology but a true believer like oh yes you know we managed to throw 18 gays off of buildings today moving the to society toward flourishing uh but in the west we would be morally horrified by that yes yeah and it sounds, from our perspective, like that's a caricature, but it's really not, yeah. actually. We see these people on the march all the time, and then yeah. when a thousand Israelis are murdered, you see a viral trend of applauding it. And bin Laden is now a hero of Gen Z. So we have to really check our own moral prejudices here. We don't have a monopoly on what right and wrong is, and some people genuinely believe things that we genuinely think are evil. In all fairness, though, to the Bin Laden thing, we have allowed TikTok and its algorithms in our culture, right? So oh, yeah. it ultimately has to come back to us at some point. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I yeah. mean, we should never have allowed the Chinese Communist Party to have any kind of ability to mold the minds of young people in the West. And they know what they're doing. And we're just really soft because we're tolerant. I, I, I believe Trump tried to ban TikTok. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, but obviously didn't succeed. I mean, I, I don't disagree with you in the strength, in the sense that, you know, the ideologies outside the West are stronger and more powerful, right? And they are, um, they are winning in a certain sense, right? I think this is correct. But again, if we kind of scale out and say, well, maybe this is providence in some very strange way, right? God moves in mysterious ways. We don't know exactly how history will go and like what these big uh, movements are. I think it comes down to, you know, our fundamental values, right? What is it that we want to protect? Um, so it would be something like, do we want to preserve something like a national culture? In which case we would need to do all of these things in order to maintain it and preserve it, right? Okay, let's do that. The net, oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry, yeah. sorry, so sorry. The, the, the problem that I have, right? And this, this really comes down to the, the crux of it is that this is the position of someone who is just losing constantly. Yeah. Right? If your question is, well, how do we preserve our national culture? The question isn't, why why, why aren't we conquering and why aren't we expanding? Why, why aren't we living authentically within a positive tradition that is constantly and effervescently pressing outwards into the world? You know, why is the world pressing on us and why are we unable to just hold on to that little what you have left? 
And so we've got to really change our mindset and say, okay, why aren't we living in an authentic tradition that produces power, energy, flourishing, that is something the, other, the rest of the world has to, oh God, the, the English are doing all of these great things like they used to actually, you know, it used to be the rest of the world was on the receiving end of our culture and being like, oh my goodness, these guys are doing great things. But we've had a complete moral collapse. We've had a complete society. They're, vo they're voting with their feet and coming here so that they want to participate in the... It's, it's, in the no, it's, it's not even that. It's because it used to be that we were... I don't want to say aggressive, but I can't think of a better way of putting it. But expansive? It, expansive, but we were, we were kind of aggressively at the forefront of what was interesting in the world and where humans realised there was a new sort of... Um, mind to be uh, vain to be mined um, and we're no longer at that with this has all surpassed us now and we're sat on our little usually rain-swept island yeah. uh, wondering why the world is invading us and until we realize what it is we should be doing to get back to the position where we are in the driver's seat culturally in our own country then this will continue and we will forever just lose ground and lose ground and lose ground can I make a claim? Uh, yeah, you can 100% make a claim. Men should have never ceded power over women. <laughs> In what context? No, no, I don't think it needs to come. Okay, okay. <laughs> Men should have never ceded power over women. Go ahead, where are you going? You're neutral. <laughs> Nina's neutral. This is a trap. This, the, every question is a trap, in a sense. You can always move again. So you're neutral. I'm surprised as a woman that you're ne neutral and Carl's on agree. Why are you neutral? Okay, so the reason I'm asking this question is kind of a trolley question, obviously, because we're, we, 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 we are where we are, right? Like we live in this world. Um, I suppose one thing that's really struck me over the past few years, which is my serious point, is the, the lack of men standing up against some of this madness, particularly when it affects women, and many men have said, well, you brought it upon yourselves, and, you know, feminism has led to this trans nonsense, and it's all your fault anyway, so, you know, we're not going to defend you, and so on, right? So this, this is a position you often hear, right? As if the telos of, of the desire for a female emancipation among some women was, uh, you know, this madness, right? Like, is this, this is what we wanted somehow, uh, which it isn't. Um, so, but it, the bigger question would be something like in the sort of course of history, you know, when some women have demanded forms of like formal equality and suffrage and so on, at every point, uh, if you like, we have been allowed to uh, become free in this way, right? So men would have ceded some control over us, whether it's in the family structure, whether in politics, da da da. Um, and did they just kind of, uh, had they just had enough? They were just like, we, we give up? You know, is it part of this kind of general sort of ruination? Um, or, or what? Men this is really going to get you in trouble now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, I'm, I'm more, more clever than that. Um, men, men just do what women want. Why? Because they care about women and they want women to be happy and they want them to love them, right? Uh, and so... You can go back to say the Victorian era and men used to treat women with an extreme amount of deference because the generations living then remembered a time when the world was a lot more difficult than people now remember it being. And so the physical inequality between men and women was um, emphasized because the world was a much more difficult place. And so men took a paternalistic and patriarchal view on how women should be treated and women wanted men to take that they wanted to be safe they wanted to be provided for they wanted to make sure their children were safe and men did what they could um now men have won they've you know the, the fact we've got airplanes flying overhead and the fact that we're not about to be invaded is the victory of western man and then for some reason women decided okay well I don't, i'm not afraid anymore uh i want what you have you don't do the things that we do so you can't have what we have. Um, but men just want women to be happy. They want them to love them. They want their approval. And so if gaining women's approval means pretending women are equal to men or, you know, saying this, that, or the other, whatever it is, they'll do it. And it's completely taken men off of the throne that they sat on. And mm. this throne was never imposed by authority, actually. It was imposed by consent. And the second women withdrew their consent for the man to be on that throne, 
well, the, man, the, the throne collapses and the men are just standing around going, okay, well, I guess I'll just play video games and drink beer all day and smoke weed. And if you don't need me, I won't do anything. Because that's really the whole raison d'etre of being a man, just to be needed by someone else. And it's always been women. And until women understand that actually they're kind of destroying men, then nothing will change because men will never be able to stand up for themselves and their own dignity. Yeah, I don't disagree with that in broad, you know, and, and much... Broad. But yeah, much much of my work about men and women have been precisely to try to talk about our compatibility and complementarity and how this whole toxic masculinity stuff is a nightmare and it's untrue and it's not actually what women want or what men want either. Um, I suppose there's a kind of economic question here, which is also to do with the way in which the you know markets and employment have also kind of brought women into the workplace and so on, which I don't think we can simply put down to a political movement. I think there are broader shifts in industrial you know in the industrial era in the modes of work which have brought men and women much closer together so that and, and eliminated the division between the kind of private and the, and the public you know in which we live now in this heterosocial mixed world where men and women are together all the time and I think this is a problem actually because it, it sort of erodes our differences and it erodes the rituals by by through which men and women used to meet and you know also the kind of magic and so on you know we, we sort of know too much about each other we're more like brother and sister you know brothers and sisters fight you know they're not <laughs> they don't want to have sex you know there's a kind of crisis of our you know they shouldn't have sex you know what i mean there's a sort of crisis of proximity um so and i i don't i can't put that down just to the history of idea it's not an idealist only you know there are all these other shifts economically and and so on materially and you know that that have, have brought that about which i don't think are you can put down to one sex or the other actually in a way and, and you could say well the industrial revolution is off the back of male invention you know women don't tend to invent things to be honest you know we're, it's not really our strength so you could say well it's it's a kind of unfortunate consequence of actually uh men's genius is the fact that we end up in a world in which you know there is there aren't these kind of great moral quests anymore or, or things that that men need to do you yeah. know but i <clears throat> but i agree that i'm very you know it's it's a tragedy that men and women are no longer seemingly in sync and that we don't understand each other you know whilst also being too close to each other as well it's i you know and i think women want to love men you know women are very sympathetic generally i think we've had our sympathy hijacked horribly by a load of really nonsense causes and this is a weakness in women too you know that we have this kind of like uh, awful um tendency towards a kind of pathological altruism oh. you know and that and that we get hijacked oh, by i love this. <laughs> i love the fact that they just walk yeah in. no it's yeah. well yeah. we are in a public park <laughs> yeah, true, man. But you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah. so and that's really bad, you know, and I think women are not protecting themselves and they're not being protected from their own emotional weakness. And those th that sympathy should be t directed towards, you know, their, their husbands and families, not generic causes, which are often actually, you know, awful, perverted and, you know, shouldn't be shouldn't be defended by anyone. <laughs> Did you want to comment on that? Or yeah, no, I, I, I think you're absolutely right. It's the uh, as I said, the man's conquest of nature. Um, seems to have set the stage for his own undoing. Yeah. Um, the fact that we can have now most jobs be essentially unisex yeah. uh, because you're sat in an office, you're filling out spreadsheets, you're sending emails. Well, actually, that doesn't require a man or a woman to do it. And eventually it'll all be done by AI. So we'll have put ourselves completely out of work. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, I think you're completely correct on that. But I do wonder why it is that the very moment that came about, women decided, yes, now is the time for us to usurp men right it was a total lack of empathy on that and now that things are falling apart um it makes me wonder is there any kind of moral burden on women collectively huh. because of what they've done to men um i don't know i mean i don't know specifically i don't think women have usurped men i don't you know i think there are I don't know how, how to put it. Well, give me an example. Sure. Um, the person in charge should be a man because a man deserves to be in charge. Uh, I realise that's slightly circular and tautological, but men, their customary role in society and the, the raison d'etre is to be the leaders and the fighters and the warriors and the providers and the protectors. And that is 
in a kind of platonic sense what the platonic form of a man is it's inappropriate for a woman to say okay i want that because you're taking something from someone else in the same way that it's inappropriate for the sort of transgender men to say okay give me a artificial womb and i'll be the mother no that's something that's reserved to women that's only for women in a in a sort of moral and spiritual way so what are you doing so the the transgender man who's trying to usurp the woman's role is doing something immoral and attacking women as women and this shouldn't this should have been resisted at the very first you know why are you even asking and the same actually goes for the dignity of men i think i mean i think with our own british tradition it is complex because of course we had great queens who oversaw our empire for example i mean elizabeth the first is like magisterial i mean queen victoria's magisterial i mean you could say these are symbolic roles okay the the, the sovereign is a symbol you know, it has multifarious meanings, right? I don't disagree. But, but I mean, Britain is like actually quite a female country in many ways, historically, right? In terms of its symbolic and seafaring nature. Like it has this kind of like female aspect, I would say. Well, I think every, every country has a female aspect. No, it's no, half no, the country's it's female. More than others. More than others. <laughs> it's, it's a more feminine country than others. Anyway, that's a weird thing to say. But um, so I, I don't disagree that, that men have meaning only in so far as their you know what someone described as their abstract rage to protect is uh is is undertaken right and i agree that this is why you see men just giving up right young men especially this is a tragedy this is a tragedy for them the suicide rates for men are extremely high i've written about this a lot it's you know this is something is very wrong here right if this means seeding uh meaning back to men and saying well women shouldn't be doing these things and men should be in charge fine i think men might have to seize it back but the problem is you've also got weak men who are um not standing up even for women right even in basic sense like against the trans stuff or whatever and i think it's hard for there not to be this cycle of resentment where one sex is saying but you've done this and the other is saying you've done that and it's like how do we break out of this resentment and say okay let's have a conversation how do we make everything um, you know, uh, it put it in its proper place, right? So let's say, okay, women tried running things, it was shit. Let's give it back to men, you know? All CEOs should be men or blah, 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 right? Whatever, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm obviously not like um, on a hard line on that. Um, I'm a lot more practical. Uh, I mean, the reason we had female queens, uh, well, sovereigns, uh, is because that's the way that um, lineal inheritance works when it comes to the crown. Um, actually, sometimes you just can't get around that. Sometimes there isn't a son. Um, but they were great queens. I'm, and I'm not saying they're not. I'm not saying they're not. I'm, a, I'm actually a lot more pragmatic when it comes to this sort of thing. But this is the kind of question that will be raised. It's like, okay, why are women asking to be in the man's role? And now, why are men asking to be in the woman's role? And it's because we've abandoned um, the kind of transcendent perspective right. on what it is to be a man and a woman. And I think we're in a position where I don't think it's coming back. What do you mean by transcendent? I was up. To, I was following you up into that word. Sure. The the I suppose you could describe it as a kind of spiritual aspect to the genders. Uh, say what it is to be a man. For example, being born male is not sufficient to make you a man. It's a necessary step, but it's not sufficient to say that you are a man. And so I walk around and I see lots of young men who are not really men because they haven't fulfilled any of the right. transcendent requirements to be okay, a man. I got you. Uh, there are lots of women in the same position, of course, as well. But it's one of those balls civilizationally that we dropped, and it's going to be very difficult to pick up, I think. Do you want to comment on that? Or you no, want to do another yeah, claim? I, I'm basically in agreement here. All right. Um, I would rather have been born a woman than a man. Go. Carl's on strongly agree. Oh, no, wait, no, sorry. I thought oh. I was disagree. Oh, you're Carl's on strongly disagree. <laughs> on disagree okay, this is great. Carl's on strongly disagree. Nina's on strongly. Okay, so to your right and to your uh, left, you'll find a, a whiteboard. Pick up the whiteboard with the marker. So you're going to write down what your best reason is for believing that. You're going to write down what your best reason is for believing that. Take your time. Just one reason. Just one reason, that's it. And then this is where it's going to get fun. Okay. So, right. guess uh, his best reason. What are you guessing his best reason for? Uh, 
because having a coffee. No, no. What is what? what oh, that's. Oh, I, I shouldn't have stopped you. But what do you? You. What, what is the claim we're looking at? I think he's going to say because having a cock is cool. Is that correct? Having a cock is cool. I don't really know the alternative. Uh, so don't tell her the reason yet. I won't. I won't. Is the reason she gave you having a cock is cool? Is it better than the reason you have on the board? <laughs> no. Okay. What do you What do you think her best reason is for believing that? I have no idea, actually. Um, I think that we're both on the strongly. Um, you're in the strongly disagree. She's on strongly yeah. agree. What, what, take a uh, guess. I, I, why I think, would she? Why would? That's a pretty strong. Sure. Right. I, I think really it comes down to basically what we know and what we've been born and raised into. Uh, I've obviously always been a man or a man, a male to be a man, and, and vice versa. So. I think it was kind of inevitable. It's it's because it's kind of I don't want to put the word safe in there because you didn't say it, but it's just what you know. Yeah, it's just familiar. Is is that don't I mean, is no, it is I that what wait wait is that what you wrote? <laughs> no, I'm. But I think there is a basic empirical point here. It's like I cannot know what it's like to be a man, and Carl can't know what it's like to be a woman, right? So, I mean, we have a basic epistemological <laughs> break okay. here, which is very beautiful. Okay, so is the reason that he gave you? Better than the reason you have on the board. Well, his his reason was he can't know otherwise. Is it better than what you wrote? Uh, it's different <laughs> from what okay, I wrote. But I it's not it's, better. Um, I mean, I agree with it, but I mean, it's also kind of obvious. But it's like, very deep. no, no, no. But I mean, it's fine. I mean, that's why I was trying to make a bad joke about like, you know, the cock. But um. Yeah. <laughs> But, but that's also tied in. Like, I can't know what it's like to be physically a man, right? So, it's awesome. Yes, yeah, so apparently. <laughs> so. Um, okay, what's your, show him your reason. <laughs> because being a woman is beautiful. What do you mean by beautiful? <laughs> I mean, actually, in a way, sort of frivolous and sort of seductive and kind of pointless almost, but sort of deeply cosmically different to men. Huh. Okay, show her your reason. Uh, I wiped it off a little bit by accident, but uh, because my body is not alien to me. Huh. Yeah. Um, one, one thing that um, we've got, I've got four kids with my wife, and uh, one thing that I noticed uh, during each pregnancy um, is that for women, their bodies are, they do things they don't expect, and they do things they can't necessarily predict. Like, as a man, your body doesn't do anything you don't tell it to do. Your body does everything you want it to do. You know, you, you, you get up, you move, you've got complete agency over almost everything in your body. If you want something to happen, you have to be the one who physically goes and makes it happen. It has to be an act of will. But actually for women, it's the other way around. Loads of things happen in their body that are not acts of will, and they can't actually stop by willing it. And so they have to, be, they have to go along with the ride, regardless of what they feel about it. I mean, what, you know, my wife would tell me about how things are happening inside of her when she's pregnant she feels these things but these are totally outside of her control and so she's got to talk about her body as if it's not her whereas to me as a man my body is very much an extension of my will and that's i think one of the reasons why men hate going to the doctors because women are used to not being in total control of their own bodies and so they're like okay well something's happened i need to go to the doctor and it's just a normal thing whereas men have got this psychological conditioning and just because their bodies never act in a way they don't expect and so they're really re reticent to go to the doctor because they might find out, oh, you're, you're dying. Well, wait, I don't control that. You know, I, I don't say that I don't have cancer. And I think that's one of the reasons. And so I just, I like the fact that I don't have to be concerned that my body's going to do a bunch of things that I don't consent to, you know? Yeah. It's a, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, I think it's very, very interesting. I, I think there is this profound difference. I mean, also, like, women live cyclically. You know, you, of course, you can take medicine and pills, but, uh, you know, they usually backfire. None of the shit actually really works. Like, you actually do have to accept the fact that you are... Um, constituted in this way and that your relation to time is different from that of men you know and i wish we understood this better because we try and pretend that these things aren't meaningful and they really really are yes i do i do think that women maybe in that sense have a relation to fate and to tragedy which is different from that of men and this is partly to do with this passivity that we do experience in relation to our own bodies it's very interesting to hear carl talk about this almost like will and autonomy like this directedness um, yeah, because it's not a f it's not a feeling that you have as a woman much of the time. I agree. Like you are at the mercy of your biology, despite how modern we 
become. It really seems it seems like you like being a woman. I do. Yeah, I think I think it's beautiful and cosmically interesting, and you know all of those things. And it's just I mean, it's also just how it is, and I accept that as a sort of poetic destiny, you know. And I I really you know I can't bear this this sort of pretending that we can change sex or you know get beyond these things. I think it's what makes us who we are is precisely this almost lack of choice. You know, I didn't choose, but it's it's how it is. It's like a gift, you know, to be a man or to be a woman. Actually, completely. I think it's also beautiful to be a woman. I, d you know, I do think that um, that it's it's also noble to be a man, yeah. and I think yeah. that's one of the things that has been drastically underserved in modern society. Um, it's very difficult to be a man for very different reasons that it's difficult to be a woman. I'm not saying yeah. it's not different, um, and I'm not saying they're equal. Um, they're just separate experiences of reality that men and women have to live through, and I think a as you were sort of saying, a better understanding of that as in in the ways that they complement one another actually might really help. New claim. It's harder to be a man now than it was to be a man a hundred years ago. That's the claim. Uh, hold on, sir. You, you want to move to a match first? Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Um, I guess I'll go neutral. You go neutral? Yeah. Where are you going to go, Nina? Um, <laughs> I mean, it's... 1923 would depend what country, what man, but, um... <laughs> true, true. Um, I'm, okay, I'm gonna... You're slightly okay, agree? Reasons, okay, what do you think? So I think there are two aspects to this question. Um, in one aspect, it's difficult in 1923 to be a man because of what you're called upon to do yeah. as a man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so being a man is a, a tough thing. But it's almost impossible to truly be a man and embody the male ideal in 2023 because there's simply no avenue for it. Because frankly, we live in a really hyper-feminized society where masculine virtues are just not respected. And in fact, everything is done possible to mitigate or exp ex extirpate masculine virtues. So becoming a man in 2023 is actually a very difficult thing to do. And the closest yeah. you'll find is someone like Andrew Tate, yeah. Uh, who doesn't have to do what he's doing, whereas in 1923 you kind of had to become a man. You didn't have a choice. We, we should have that conversation with Tate later because oh, I have yeah, sure. pretty strong opinions about that. Uh, oh, go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this this question of the absence of meaning or the absence of social role and, you know, the shift in where our values lie have made it harder in some ways, right, for sure. Um I, I mean, I don't like the zero-sum game idea that if one sex, you know, moves, the other one loses, you know. I mean, I think this is part of a very negative but utilitarian frame of thinking. But yeah. I but I definitely think, yeah, this question of values, it's like, you know, when I've just been reading lots of books and writing about, like, fatherlessness, right? Like, this is a huge problem. Like, this is basically the biggest problem for young men today yeah. is fatherlessness. That almost no one talks about right. all that. It, uh, lots of people are now talking about it. But, yes, they're basically sidelined and demonized and, you know, oh, my God, you're attacking you know, single mothers, you're attacking gay families, whatever. No, but in reality, it, it everything looks like this, right? So there's this kind of um, absence of uh, a strong re male role models, right? Which are then being filled in by these kind of like actors in a way, like Tay and others, who's also Muslim, allegedly, um, because he's into polygamy or whatever, you know, I mean... You know, and this is this is seriously bad. So I think we've got this lack of moral expectation for men to stick around. And, and in a way, I defend Christianity in this way precisely for its commitment um, and emphasis on fidelity and the sanctity and unity of the family. Right. And I would say Christian, one of the reasons I'm, I am Christian is because I think it's better for women and children and men by virtue of its emphasis on the nuclear of the family as such as this strong yeah. unit. Right. Against the kind of liberal individualism or, you know, but really what's going on with these men is, is that there is a lack of economic opportunity so that they are not seen as reliable providers. Right. Yeah. So really what you need to do is actually restore meaning and jobs, actually to men in general, especially working class, non-college educated men, right? And then they will become marriageable, right? Well, we're gonna wrap up in a second. Do you wanna comment on that? Sure. I, I kind of noticed that the, um, the question of fatherlessness is never 
the locus of concern is never within the father themselves. It's always what does that effect have on other people rather oh, than what's that yeah. effect have on the father. Um, that's why men commit suicide, I think. A lot of men commit suicide because of what's happened to them in their family lives. And, I mean, I don't, I don't think we need to relitigate just how stacked against men uh, the court system and the social system towards fathers is. And we don't, we don't consider the father to be a role in nobility anymore. Yeah. The, the father is the order setting person in the house he's yeah. the one who is the person of final resort and is the one who has to actually enforce the rules and you know my wife god bless her does her best but she doesn't have the voice uh the man has a voice that the children respond to uh, and this is an important role and suddenly you're you're in a position as the father where you've got essentially ultimate power of your children and mm. you're the judge, you're the jury, and you, you're the executor of the judgments. And mm. so this places a huge moral burden on fathers. I think a lot of people don't really respect or appreciate. And then whenever we talk about fatherlessness, we always talk in the context of someone else, yeah, yeah. as if the father himself is kind of an afterthought, when actually he's really not. And his impact on the family or lack thereof will echo for generations. Mm. And nobody wants to talk about that, really. Yeah. No, I agree with that. And I, I think, you know, we do need to restore the father. I mean, I had the benefit of having a good father, mm, right? And, uh, you know, there's nothing better than that, right? You know, it's it's like whatever problems I have are mine, but I had a good father and I had a good family. And the idea that we're not promoting that for everyone, as much, insofar as it's possible, there will always be tragic situations, there will always be, but that should be our model. This should be absolutely the thing that we defend the most. And I agree, it's not just about the benefits for women and children, it's about the father himself yeah. and the, the role of the father. I mean, I, we're in agreement on this, but I think it, it, the part of the response is economic, and I don't know how we get back to an economy in which there is meaning and value placed on you know, male work, because we've destroyed male work as such, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm freezing, so I'm yeah, going to yeah. <laughs> wrap but, it up. We, we ended on a good note. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, do you have fun? Oh, it was great. Yeah, did you have fun? <laughs> oh, it was wonderful. Yeah, great. Well, thank you for playing Spectrum Street for Smology. Reed, get a picture. <laughs> thank you so much. That was so much fun. That was great. That was great. Oh,